Well, how are you guys doing tonight? You good? You look marvelous. You look marvelous. You didn't, and you know what? Turn to whoever's sitting next to you. Just turn next to them and say, you look marvelous. There you go. You guys are marvelous. It's awesome. It is, it is so cool to stand here with my family and get to talk to you about Jesus Christ and our God. It is, it is amazingly cool. And it is humbling. And it is just, it scares the wajibis out of me, quite frankly. So tonight, may, may it not just be me that you're, you're hearing or seeing, but may the presence of God really be on you. May, may the Holy Spirit be indwelling within you. May, may you pull something much, much grander out of tonight than the meager words that I use. Because that's really what the point is. And may God be glorified. That's the whole point of it. So last week I talked to you guys about the second greatest commandment, according to Jesus. The first one being what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And the one we're talking about, the second one, he said, was love your neighbor as yourself. Or as you love yourself. Depends on the translation. But you get the idea. And we talked about that and we said, you know what, everybody seems to be okay and pretty cool with loving God. Love God's pretty good. We get that. He's amazing. He created everything. He's, he's incredible. We can love God pretty well. But loving our neighbor as ourself, that gets a little rough. And we talked about the different ways that, that we separate. We divide into male and female. We divide into Spanish-speaking, English-speaking. We divide into all these splinter groups. It always seems to be an us and them. And then we went into, and we shared, I shared some stories with you about different people that, that Jesus met. Because the, the whole question was, who's my neighbor? Who am I loving? And we talked about Zacchaeus, which I got right this week. And we talked about how, how people, and if you guys remember this, that Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and people, people thought he was a cheater, he was a coward, he's a traitor, he's slimy, he's no good. But this is not what Jesus thought about him. Jesus, Jesus loved him. He, he sees good in him. He wants to go to his house, and he welcomes him into the family. And that's, a, that's an amazing, amazing thing. And then we talked about the woman at the well in John chapter 4. There's what others thought about this woman, that, that she's cheating she cheats. She's unfaithful. She's had five husbands. She's living in sin. She's loose. There's adultery in her life. She's a tramp. She's shameful. You get the idea. But what does Jesus see? What does he do? He shows her mercy. He says, shows her equality. He motivates her. He says that she is one. And he, and he takes away the boundaries. You guys came up with these things. He takes away the rules. And he says she's accepted. And she is good. And she turns into an evangelist. She talks about Jesus to her whole entire village because of the way she was treated. And it's amazing what happens. And then finally we talked about the adulterous woman. And what do others think about her? This woman was thrown into a crowd as Jesus was teaching. and She was caught in the act. They said she's convicted. She's an adulterous woman. She's condemned. She's used. She's, she's branded. She's no good. She's, and there's a double standard because the very people that are actually screaming that she should be stoned, which is what the law says, have their own problems. And then the kids helped me out after the service with this, so we won't go over that. But how does Jesus approach her? With compassion, with saving forgiveness, with grace. And that's where we were like left off last week. And we discovered, well, who's my neighbor? Well, when in Jesus' eyes, his neighbor was whoever he, he ran into, the people that he came across. 
And you talked about the Greek word that is used for neighbor, meaning person who's near. That's it. That's what it stands for. So if you spoke Greek, you would understand that word as, as being just someone close to you, someone near to you. And we left it last week with a question. How do I love like that? How do I love people that way? Because Jesus says in Matthew, he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemies. But I say, pray for your enemies and love them. How do I do that? Because that's hard. That's crazy hard. So now that we know who our neighbors are, how do we love our neighbors? And what does that mean? I know a lot of times that can mean for a lot of people that I'm just a doormat, that I just give away everything, that, that I just let people take everything from me. But that's not what Jesus now did, is it? I think really what it has to do with is the second part of that verse. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so we're going to look tonight more in depth of what does that mean to love yourself? Because that's almost, that's anti-Christian, right? I mean, just, no, you're not supposed to love yourself. How arrogant. You're supposed to be humble. You're supposed to be low. You're not supposed to love yourself. What kind of people love themselves? Right? I mean, isn't that what we're taught? As a Christian, that you, in, in so many places, I know when I was growing up, that's the message I got. I was supposed to think less of myself. That I was not equal. That I was worth less. But I don't think that's what Jesus thinks about himself. I don't think that's what the impression that I get from the scriptures of the way he looks at himself. And if I'm going to be an imitator of Christ, shouldn't I imitate him in everything? And even self-image. So our neighbor is, is one who is near. And people, as we saw in those three stories, we can be judgmental, can't we? I mean, we can really be judgmental. We, we judge everything. Everything. Absolutely everything. That chair is a nice chair. It's cushy. I like it. It's got padded. That's a bad chair. Amen. Right? Um, that table, that's cool to sit at. But if I don't have a table, that's, that's not so cool. Lexus, cool car. Lamborghini, that's cooler. We judge everything. Cool color shirt. Maybe you don't think so, though. Maybe you think it's awful. Wow, that's a horrible shirt. And the guy's got yellow shoes on and he's trying to preach. Oh, my goodness. We judge everything. So, I want to go through that a little bit. Because, I don't know, judgment's not all bad, right? It's not bad. So, let's just say, just draw a little picture. Two circles. What do you guys think about those? You like the red one better than the black one. It's, what, can you say, what can you say about these circles? Okay, so there's a difference in size, right? Here? Okay. They're, what else about the circles? They're, they're not actually perfect circles, are they? Okay. That's fair. The black, the, the black one's better than the red one. Okay. What else can we say about them? Different colors, right? The fact is they're both just circles. They're both just circles. There's, there's not one that's better than the other one, is there? Doesn't matter. Maybe you like one better than another one. But as far as what they are as circles, they're just circles. 
They, they, all of a sudden, when you say one is better than another one, let's say you have the opinion that bigger is better. So then you, maybe you like the red one better. So if bigger is better, that's a value judgment. We've just put value to this one and said, this is, this is good, this is not as good. But the truth is, they're just circles. It doesn't matter until we make it matter. Until we actually start to judge more than what we see, we start making value judgments on what they're worth. And that's when we get into trouble. Have you guys ever seen Rain Man? The movie? Dustin Hoffman and... What's that other guy? Tom Cruise. That's it. There's a scene that I love in that movie where Dustin Hoffman, the Rain Man, is at the doctor's. And they're kind of exploring his autism. And they're asking him some questions like, how much is 13 times 596? And he just, boom, rattles off the answer. And it's incredible. The guy's got a calculator, the doctor, and he checks it. And he's right. And he asks him another question, how much is 1,785 divided by 42? Boom, he's got it. Third question, incredible. He says, what's the square root of, and he uses this huge, crazy number, right? Raymond, he comes up with it, out to like five digits. Incredible. But then he asks him, how much is a candy bar? About $100. I said, how much is this, is this new sports car? Oh, about $100. It's funny how judgment changes and how perception changes. That you can be off in judgments. And if you are off in judgments, then all of a sudden things get out of perspective. We don't look at things the same way when we uh, assign values to them. Rain Man didn't understand the value of things. And I think sometimes we don't understand the value of things. If you're following with me, I'm really talking about people. We make judgments all the time with people. And we don't have understand what they're worth or what they're not worth. But we sure do make the judgments about them. And judgments in themselves are not bad. They're good. Because I need to know if I should pull out in a traffic or not. I need to know if I'm going into a dangerous situation. I need to make judgments about my world. But when I start assigning value, worth, to things that I should not, I get into trouble. I start looking at people in different ways. I work in downtown Orlando, and I regularly see people walk past the shop where I work. Some of them are pushing shopping carts. I think homeless. I think broke, I think unloved, I think all sorts of things about these people. I see a, a, a woman walk by, dressed a little provocatively. I think all sorts of things. These images pop into my head. I judge them by the way they look. I judge appearances, I judge by size, I judge everything. And I'm guessing we all do this. So how do you get past that? How do you move past judging people? That adulterous woman, she was caught dead to rights. The law says if you're an adulterer, you get stoned. And what does Jesus do? He goes against all these value judgments. All these things that says, this woman deserves death. And instead, he asked people to go deeper. Because you remember the story? He doesn't talk, right? It says they pressed him for an answer. What should we do with this woman? 
And he just starts scribbling in the ground. He starts drawing something. Doesn't say what. And then finally he says, all right then, but let the one who never sinned throw the first stone. It's interesting. He calls people in to look at their own self. Not at the person that, that's sitting there before them caught red-handed. Not the person that, that is obviously guilty. That she doesn't speak a word. She doesn't say anything in her defense. She knows she's caught. Jesus calls on the other people to look at their own hearts. And they all drop their stones. And they go home. Well, I want to pick up that story. But first, I, I want to draw one more diagram for you. Because what these people were doing is something I think we all do. And it works like this. Because this is the way we were taught. Let's say there's God. And there's obedience. Big O. And there's us, who is loved, right? So the way we're taught, the way the world works, if you're going to judge things, is what? You get the rules from God. You need to be obedient to God. And if you're obedient to God, he'll love you. And then you'll have a relationship with him. Makes sense, doesn't it? Just do the right thing and God is going to love you. Simple. This is the law. This is the law that the Jews went by. This is the way they worked. This is the way they thought. And I dare say it's the way we still think. If you really look at yourself the way... Jesus called on those people that were going to stone that woman to look at yourself. You're going to ask yourself questions. Am I good enough? Have I obeyed God's laws? Have I let them down? And the thing that you're going to run into is you're never going to get to this part where your identity as a loved person is because you're never going to measure up. There's always going to be something you're going to stumble on. There's always going to be something you're going to, going to trip you up something you're going to fall and we all suffer with this and we live with it and we constantly fight with ourselves so either you think I'm really good and I got this whole God Jesus thing down and I can do this thing so I am loved or maybe you think just the opposite I'll never get this and I'm never going to be loved well, I think both are wrong Let's turn to Jesus and see what, uh, what he had to say about it. John chapter 8, verses 12 through 18. This is right after he tells the woman to go home. Don't sin anymore. I don't condemn you. I forgive you. Now the crowd's still there. The Pharisees are still there. And this is what Jesus said, starting in verse 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And the Pharisees replied to him, You're making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. And Jesus told them, these claims are valid even though I make them about myself. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know this about me. You judge me by human standards, but I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I'm not alone. The Father who sent me is with me. Your own law says that if two people agree about something, their witness is accepted as fact. 
I am one witness, and my Father who sent me is the other. What strikes me about this is verse 14. He says, for I know where I came from and where I am going. What does that mean? He knows who he is, doesn't he? he he's got no question about who he is and what he's doing and where, where he's going. None. So when he makes a claim, when he says something, he's standing on really solid ground. Really solid ground. Well, I want to know that. I want to know that about myself. I want to know without a shadow of a doubt, just like Jesus Christ, who I am and where I stand. And I want to know how to get there. But that's a tough part. That's a hard thing to do. The other thing Jesus says here is he says that they judge him by human standards. That everything, and human standards, they're all conditional, aren't they? If I'm obedient enough, I'll be loved. If I follow the rules enough, I can get loved. I can be who I'm going to be. All those are human standards. They're all things that we set up and they end up being roadblocks to actually being loved, to actually feeling loved, actually having that identity of loved. We know Jesus Christ was loved, right? Do you remember the story when John baptized him in the Jordan? It says, the Spirit descended upon him and a voice said, this is my beloved Son who I am well pleased. He knows it. He draws it from the Father. And he says so here in our passage we just read. He says that not only I say it, the Father who sent me testifies to it. This is a clue for us. How do we, how do we really know we're loved? How do we really know that it's truth, that we're not just making this up, that we're not just arrogantly overflowing our, our elevating our own stature? Because the Father tells us this, just like Jesus knew it. He heard his voice. He, he felt his presence. He knew what the Father was thinking. He said what the Father would say. He says, I only say what the Father gives me to say. I only do what the Father's will is. I only follow him. And he does some amazing things. He turns the world upside down. He saves the world because of that. But the world says you've got to have the right habits. Well, you've got to have your house clean. If you don't have a house clean, you're not a good person. If, if you drive a, a junky car, no good. You need to buy a new car. Because you need, you need a Lexus. And if you're not striving to get a Lexus, what's wrong with you? If, if you're not striving to make more money, what, what is happening with you? Because you're just not right. If, if your kids don't wear all the perfect clothes, then, then you're just a your bad mother, your bad father, your bad parent. Why don't you feed, feed your, your kids fresh food, your family fresh food every day? Why don't you do these things? Do you not love them? You're awful. Human standards. The right customs. I speak English. Other people here, I, I, I'm sure there's somebody here that probably speaks Spanish fluently. And if you're raised in a, in a house, in a Spanish-speaking house, you've got different customs. You don't do everything the same way that I did growing up in Midwest as a, as a white American. You've, you've been brought up differently. Your customs are totally different. So. Do I force you into a box? Well, you're American now. You're in America. You have to do it my way. 
or the right friends and the right family. You're hanging out with the wrong people. You're hanging out with sinners, Jesus. Remember that? Zacchaeus, remember the comment from the people? He's going to the house of that sinner, that outcast, that no good guy. Another point, he gets caught at a party with, with Matthew, hanging out at Matthew's house, one of the, one of the disciples. And it says he hangs out with drunkards and partiers. And they judge him by who, whose company he keeps. This is the way the world has told us how we decide on what our value is, who we, what we're worth. These are, these are the benchmarks, these are the rulers, these are the scales that the world has used for forever, it seems. And we believe it because everybody else believes it, because everybody else uses the same benchmarks, because everybody else says the same things. But what if it's not really like that? What if we've been wrong all this time? That the money won't fill the, the hole of self-worth of, of that I'm a loved person. The friends are not going to fill that hole. The family, you can't have enough kids. You can't have a good enough marriage. You can't have a good enough job. You can't have a good enough life to be able to do it on your own. I'll be 51 this year. And it's not that old, but it's old enough to have been around the block a few times, to have tried everything to find out it's empty. Everything so far, except for Jesus Christ, has been an empty tomb. It's just been death. It's just been one empty thing after another. But it seems that I have to turn over every rock and every stone, and I've got to try it first before I'll actually believe that it's empty. I've got to try it for myself. Is drinking, is that going to help? Well, yeah, it's a good time for a while. Till I get sick. Till I lose my job. Yeah, it changes your life. Is, is sleeping around a good thing? For a while, yeah, it's good. Until you find out you're just lonely because all the people that you've left in your dust the broken hearts, the relationships. And then the next thing you know, your life's full of shame. It's full of guilt. You're never going to get to this love part. You're never going to be this person. Because guess what? Of all the things that you've not obeyed, you're never getting here. God won't let you. He hates you. Hates your guts. And we believe it. Maybe we don't talk about it. Maybe we don't say it. But we all carry it around, don't we? It, it comes on you sometimes in, in the middle of the night or when you're all alone or in different circumstances and you remember. Maybe you see it in somebody else's face. Maybe you watch something happen on TV. You watch a movie and it all comes flooding back. I remember what I did. And I'm rotten. I'm worthless. Who could love me? It all boils down to, to kind of one thing. I mean, to put it in a nutshell, if that's the way we're operating, and that's where we're getting our self-worth, we're basically saying, What I'm doing defines who I am. Right? My actions determine who I am. Am I good? Am I a big circle or a little circle? Do I drive the good car or the bad car? What I do is what I am. And that's the way we're taught. Be a good boy. Be a good girl. Do the right thing. Right? It's totally backwards. Because the truth is because of 
who God is and what he's done makes us who we are and what we do. That's the way it really works. But that's not the way we've been taught. But Jesus knew this. Jesus knew this completely. And if you want proof of it, it's right in the beginning of your Bible. It starts right in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. Let's talk about this. Who is God? Verse 26, that God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So who is God? God's creator, right? God's creator. So what does a creator do? Creates. Perfect. So that, what's that make us? The created. So what do you think we should do? Recreate. Matter of fact, it takes two of us, doesn't it? Male and female. It takes two. We're co-creators. And why is this? First, right back to verse 26. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So we were made to be like God. Heaven forbid that I should actually say that, right? But it's right there in the Bible. It says we were made to be like him. We're supposed to be that way. That's the way we started out. It's in the beginning of the book. We're 26 verses in, and this is what's going on. God's making people to do what? To co-create. It says, next thing, they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky and the livestock, all the wild animals of the earth, and the small animals that scurry on the ground. Verse 27, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You notice how he repeats himself? It says, let's make them in our image. And then it says, so God made them in our image. Remember those two witnesses we just talked about? Jesus and the Father? We've got two witnesses right here. That's why it's written that way. It's true. They want it to be true. So he had to have two witnesses. So that's why it's twice. So what else is true about, about God? Verse 28, Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill all the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So what else is God? God is also ruler, right? I mean, God rules. He made the whole thing, the planets, the stars, the moon, us, the, the plants, animals, fish, all this. What's he doing? He rules, right? That's what he does. God is a ruler who rules, and we are the ruled. We're supposed to follow his direction. We're supposed to be in a relationship with him. This isn't just for, for fun. And it's not because God just is an egomaniac kind of a thing. It's because this is the way we're set up to work. We're like him. We're supposed to be like him. We follow his rules. And so we rule over all the earth, all the animals. We're entrusted. He says, I made this whole place. Rule it. I made you like me. You can do it. He's got confidence in us. It's like, you can take care of this thing. The oceans, the fish, the birds, the, the sky, everything. Go. Go co-create, multiply, and rule over it. Take care of it. You're like me, so I know that you'll do a good job. We'll go a little further. Still in Genesis. And God said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all its fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals 
the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Verse 31, And God looked over all he had made, and he saw it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. He saw it was very good. God says it was good. Why? Why can he say that? Because God's good, isn't he? He is good. So what is he doing? He's doing good. All the stuff he created? Who digs trees? You, got, you guys like cows? Because you get steak. You like shrimp? You like chicken? Dan likes chicken. Michael likes chicken. You like pigs? You, you like looking out and seeing a blue sky? You like fluffy white clouds? This stuff is good. He made things good. What does that make me? Good. Exactly. So what should I do? Good. I should do good. And how do I do good? Because I know that he's good, he does good, he made me good, and I'll do good. Because of my identity is not the stuff, it's not the way people tell me what is good and bad, it's what God says is good and bad. That is where my identity is. What God does tells me who I am. God made me good. God made me to do good. And I can do good. One other verse that I want to bring up to you is uh, it's in John. Where did you go? There we go. First John. 4, 8. You don't have to turn to this. It says, But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Finally, over all this, God's love, right? It says it right there. He is. So what does he, God do? God loves. Who does he love? Us. What do we do? We can love, can't we? Jesus knew who he was. Remember what he said? I knew who I am, and I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. And I talk to the Father, and we, we, I do what he says. How do we love people that we can't stand? How do we love our enemies and pray for them? Because we're grounded in who we are. That's how. Because we love ourselves. Because we understand that the Father loves us. That he always has loved us. He always will love us. He made us that way. We're made to love. We have the ability to love. I think part of how you love yourself is how you actually love other people. Because I'll tell you, for one that struggles to love their self, because I've believed the lie for way too long that I'm no good, that I'm not loved. You want to love on other people? You want to be able to love your enemies? It's got to start right here. And that sounds so wrong but it's so right. You've got to love yourself first before you can love anybody else. Because you can't give away what you don't got. And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died for that to happen. Because he knew we couldn't do it on our own. God knew, hey, left to their own devices, they just can't, they just can't do this. So let's go back. Let's go back to our triangle. This is the world's way, right? Here's God's way. God says, I'm sending my son. His name is Jesus. And you know what? He's going to pay for all those mistakes. 
Those ones that you'll never pay for in a million years. Those things that, that you just cannot take care of yourself. And he's going to love you to the point where he's going to suffer on a cross and die. That's, that's how much God loves you. That's how sure you can be that it's true. You don't do that for just anybody. You do that for, for someone you love. You lay down your life for who? People you love. God lays down his, his very own life in the form of Jesus Christ so that what? We would know, first and foremost, we are loved without any conditions because he already knows we're all jacked up. He knows we can't do it right. He already knows that we're, we're the unlovable according to the world, that we're never going to make the mark. He knows all this, and he loves us anyway. It's called unconditional love. And we're soaking in it. it we're like, and, and it's so pervasive, and it's so amazing. It's like, it's like a fish in water that looking for water. He doesn't know he's not in water until you take him out of it. We're so bathed in love, God's love, we don't even know we're in the middle of it. We don't know how huge and immense he is. If he created the universe and he loves and God is love, do you understand that you are surrounded by God's love everywhere, every moment, everywhere you go, everything you do, there is nothing that escapes that love. There's no way you're going to lose it. There's no way you're going to get away from it. He's everywhere. He's all time. He's all powerful. And out of this love, you can be obedient. You can start to follow the rules because you know exactly where you are. You know who you are and you know where you're going. You know that your father has sent Jesus Christ to die for your sins. You know that you are loved. You know that, that Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it was not true, I would have said so. You know where you're going. As a Christian, you know this. Christ is bedrock. He is the love that you stand upon. And that allows you to do amazing things. That's the abundant life that he talks about. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Why? Because I've just got rid of this whole rules thing. We saw it with the three people. He threw the rules out. Zacchaeus, despicable. Jesus loves him. Goes to his house. Welcomes him back to the family. The woman at the well, horrible life. Five husbands. Not married to the one she's with right now. Jesus loves her right where she's at. Throws a rule book out. He should have shunned her. By all accounts of this world and human standards, he should have told her to get out of his face. She was a woman. She was a Samaritan. And at this time, he should have had nothing to do with her. And finally, the adulterous woman, caught, guilty, flat, done, deserves death, and what's he do? He says, I don't condemn you. Now go and don't sin anymore. It seems the key to obedience, if you really want to hang up on that, is you've got to be loved first. You've got to know this deep inside. It's powerful. It doesn't mean you're, you're a doormat. It doesn't mean you let other people walk over you. It means that you know who you are and nothing shakes that. Because God is solid. And whatever comes your way doesn't change this. Whatever happens in your life, you lose your job, doesn't change who you are. You're still loved by God. Your, your husband and your wife leaves you, doesn't matter. You're still loved by God. You lose your legs because you go over and fight in, in Iran or something. And an IUD takes your legs out. Does it make you less of a person? Nope. You're still loved by God. That is your basis for everything. And that frees you up to love other people the same way. Because when you see each other, when we look at each other here, 
We see the flaws, right? Because we're judgmental. We see them all, right? Guess what? I don't have to judge you by that. I get to love you anyway. I get to love you even though you got flaws. You get to love me even though I do. Even though I could say Zachariah instead of Zacchaeus for 10 minutes last, last week, you could, still, you could still love me. And I don't have to be annihilated with shame because I did it. I get to be loved because God tells me who I'm loved, that I'm loved. Because he died for me. And I get to then be obedient and I can start loving folks like I had never loved them before. People that, that are just awful. Because I, I don't see people for all the things they've done anymore. I see them just like God has taught me to see myself. One made in his image. Child of God. Forgiven. Loved. Worth dying for. That's how Jesus could help these folks. And that's how we can. As we follow him, then we will become more obedient. And you know what? And it's just going to make us closer to God. And then we're going to be more like Jesus. And this actually just starts to turn into a big circle. That love we're shown first, that mercy, that grace, gives us the power to give mercy and grace to others. And that is like the best feeling in the world because no longer do you have to judge or be judged. No longer do you have to be held to the world's standard. Jesus Christ wiped out the rules. He wiped out the law. And your life is freedom. Freedom. And that tastes so good. That's like a breath of fresh air. That is amazing. Who's loved here in this room? Everyone. So, the second commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Who's your neighbor? Everybody. Everybody. Anybody who's near. And how do you love them? Same love that you've been given. You love other people. They may do rotten things to you. They may do horrible, unspeakable things, or you may do that to them. It doesn't change the fact that you still love them. You still care about them. You don't have to deal with some of this stuff. If, if somebody does you wrong, I don't want you to get me wrong. Take me wrong. It doesn't make you a doormat. That doesn't mean that you just let them do whatever to you. Okay? What it does mean is it doesn't change who you are when you say no. Okay? You don't get to do that to me. I'm a child of God. I am loved by the creator of the universe. You don't get to annihilate my identity. You don't get to change who I am. You can do some really rotten things. And I can, guess what? I can not like you. And I can tell you that I don't want to be around you. It doesn't change the fact that I'm loved. And I still care about you. But that what you did is not good. And eventually... I can come to a place where I can forgive them. I can forgive them for that. I can ask for forgiveness for it. But we've got to understand who we are first. So this whole thing boils down to one saying. I can love without condition because I am, was, and will be loved conditionally unconditionally. Let me get that right again. I can love without condition because I am, was, and will be unconditionally loved. And I can love myself and love others in the same way because Jesus shows me just how much God loves me. It's a lot for just a little commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But it's who we are as Christians and as we follow Christ. And tonight, 
I want to do something a little different. Everything's different tonight. No band, except for the one man Bo Moses band. We're going to take communion tonight, but we're going to do it in a different way. Normally we just hand this out, but tonight I'm going to ask each of you to come forward. And I know this is out of your comfort zone for some of you guys. I know it, it's maybe hard, and, and maybe you don't want to do this, and it's okay. Nobody's going to judge you for doing this or not doing this. But I want to invite you, if, if you can stretch maybe just a little bit, if you can be, if you thought, you know what, maybe, maybe I can live loved. Maybe I can love these people around me. Maybe I can do this. When he's been working on something here is, I've been yakking. Are you set? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> yep. It's only right we put this in front of the cross because this is what the cross is all about. Tonight, I'm gonna, I invite you to come forward, to come down this aisle. Stop. Take a look in this mirror. Read who you are. All these words are in the Bible. All these. Look at your reflection. Look how much you're loved. Start believing the truth. That it's not your performance, it's not what you do, it's what God has done and is doing that tells you who you are. And then at that point, we've got a basin here. Warm water. And we're going to, for those that would like to partake, we're going to wash each other's hands. We're going to love each other. The disciples, Jesus washed their feet. That gets a little weird. So we thought... Hand washing, that's okay. And it's just water. There's no soap. It's just water. And we've got some towels. And as, as one person stands on this side, I wonder if you'd come forward. I want you to say something to the person that, that you're, we're going to just take turns. I can love you unconditionally because I, I am loved unconditionally. We wash the hands. Take the towel. She takes my place. Dan, if you would. And pass the towel off. We take communion and go back to your seat. And then we'll take communion together. So if you would.